daily lives. For example, we can ask a question to ChatGPT and it will give us an answer within a few seconds without having to search on the internet for, for the result ourselves. Or when we see something interesting down the street, we can take a picture of it and Google Lens will tell us everything about it uh, and give us some extra Google-like information about it. Also, we can just talk to our devices and with the, the speech-to-text technology of these days, it will just note on everything that we say, which is very nice to answer a family or friend uh, very quickly. We don't really see this in our daily lives, but also some medical advancements. For example, we can now take a picture of an area on our skin and then an AI will tell us if we have an, a risk for skin cancer or not. Um, so this also helps medical professionals as well as yeah, potential uh, risks for patients. Now the important question is, of course, how does this AI work? Well, data. Lots and lots and lots of different data. Um, in the example use case of the, the Google Lens, um, we show it a lot of different examples. Each time we show it a picture with a label on it. For example, this is a picture of a dog, and then we label this as a dog. We show it another picture of another dog and label this as a dog. And then we also show it some picture of cats, for example. And we do this not just three times, but millions and millions and millions of times, with millions of data points. And in the end, the AI will learn the different distinguishing features of each of these animals and other objects that we can photograph. Now, once we have our trained AI, we can say, okay, what's on this picture? A picture that it has never seen before of another dog. And then the Google Lens will say, okay, this is a dog. Great, that works. But now what would happen if there are errors in this data set? In our example here, I just changed the labels from these two pictures of a dog to a cat. And then the Google Lens, the next time we will show it that same picture and ask it what it is, it will say, this is a cat. I can tell you this is wrong because I checked it this morning. She said woof woof, not meow meow. So um, it's definitely a dog. Um, so the, the takeaway here is AI is only as good as the data that we give it. So we need to make sure that this data is wrong, right. Because when the data is wrong, our conclusion will also be wrong. If the data is right, then our conclusion might be right depending on the model and training and so on and so forth. Now, how do we tend to do this? Well, we look at the data pipeline. This pipeline is built up on different pieces of uh, yeah, a pipeline. So we start with some raw data, then we <coughs> prepare this data to according to some processes, depends on the business, on, on the use case, and then finally it is handled to data consumers. For example, a machine learning algorithm or a business that has to make decisions uh, for value and so on. What we intend to do, or what intended to do with this uh, thesis was we want to insert a part of the pipeline between the preparation and consumer step called data validation. Before the data goes through the consumers, we want to make sure it is valid and of good enough quality so the consumers can make good decisions on this. And we tend to do this by solving the data ingestion validation problem. Now, what is this problem? Well, it's kind of funny. I took the train today and, uh, well, one of the trains had a technical defect, so it's, it's funny that I'm using a train data set for my example today. Um, but what happens if we just log everything that trains do? And what happens is a train obviously drives from, train to st uh, from station to station, and each time a train arrives at a new station, it adds a row to our data set. Each row is just, uh, I'm this train number, I arrived at this station, and I have so many seconds delay. Okay, and the next time it goes to station two, it adds another row to this data set, and the same for station three, it adds another row. And this train does this for every single stop, but obviously we don't do this for every single, for just a single train, we do this for all of the trains in our data set, which are, of course, many, many different trains, and at the end of the day, we get about 70,000 rows um, of train stops, expected rows. And that will look something like this. And this is just one day of data, but again, we don't collect this just for a single day because, well, we have computer systems, we can do this for multiple days, and if we do this, we get a historical sequence of data. And this is something that we can utilize to make analysis and then uh, make better decisions. How do we do this? Well, the data ingestion validation problem is, given this historical sequence of data that we collected throughout history, can we validate the batch of tomorrow that we have never seen before that this is of good enough data quality? And what kind of errors can occur in these, these kinds of batches? Why do we need to do this? Well, a single train might have a broken clock. And with this broken clock, that could mean that the train will always report exactly zero delay because it arrived at the same time than it left at the same time. Um, so the delay is always exactly zero. Would be great, train always arriving perfectly on time, not a second early, not a second late, but it's kind of unrealistic. 
Another error might be that for one train the GPS sensor goes down and it always thinks that at the Yang station um, or any other station it always thinks that it's exactly the same location. So that's also not very good. But it can happen that this GPS sensor goes down for let's say the entirety of Belgium. How unlikely that might be. But then suddenly all of the trains would think they're at the Yang station instead. Okay. Another thing that might occur is the server goes down. And then we only see four rows instead of the expected 70,000 rows in our data set. So again, those are different types of errors. And yeah, that leads me to the next part, which is the types of errors. We have two parts, which is errors that affect a very limited number of rows and errors that affect a very large number of rows. The first two, where only a single train has an, uh, an error in the data, those are very limited in the number of rows, let's say maybe 10, 15 rows. But the last two, well, they, they affect tens of thousands of rows in our data set, so a much larger data set. How has this been solved? Well, there are many softwares that do this already. Um, I've listed some of them here. It's not an exhaustive list, there are many more. Um, but they all work on constraints or data unit tests. And the problem with these is they are based mostly on column-based metrics and they uh, like good automated data unit test suggestions. I will go into more detail about what these parts are and I'll, I'll explain it as I go along. So what are these column based metrics? Well, I think most of you are all familiar with these, let's say just a simple row count or the minimum or average of a, a single row uh, or column, uh, I should say. Uh, so yeah, we're all familiar with these. An example might be we just count the number of uh, trains in our data set and this would be equal to the number of stops in that single day. So this metric already describes that. Now, what would happen with these data unit tests when they're column based is we get our historical sequence of data, run some ma magic algorithms on them like the, the software that I described or just anything to learn from it. And then it might say, okay, I expect the count of the trains, so the number of stops of all of the trains together, to be between 70,000 and 73,000 rows, rows for any given weekday. Then when the batch of tomorrow arrives, we validate this metric, so the count of the trains, to be between that specific range. In this is a simple example, so just run count trains on that new batch, and then the batch is either accepted or rejected based on the outcome of this train metric, or this count train metric. The problem is that these metrics are too coarse grained. If we have the scenario where there is a single train with a broken clock that always reports exactly zero delay, these three rows, they will not change significantly enough for any metric to be able to detect this error. So the column based metrics will not deviate at all, maybe 1.001% uh, or something like that. Um, it's a very, very small deviation that's hard to pick up. And that is why we propose conditional metrics. These conditional metrics, they select a subset of the table and then compute the column-based metric on that. So let's go through this step by step. How we do this, we have our metric, let's say the average, and we want to calculate this on the delay column. We do this conditionally based on some value in the train number column. Uh, and this train number has to be, for example, 1507. And then we get the average delay for just that specific region in our data set. So that's already a bit, bit smaller. A quick side, okay, so the, now the conditional metrics will be able to detect the error because there is a large deviation in the data. A quick side note here, this last part uh, that will become a bit more important later on in the presentation, we call an entity. So the last part of the conditional metric is an entity. It will become clear why this is, but I want to highlight this now. Now, how do we generate these data unit tests? Well, we can compare the column-based metric to the conditional metric to see their advantages. Let's say we run this in a column-based fashion, so we run the average for the entire delay column. This is expected between minus 30 seconds and 300 seconds. Uh, and in this case, the batch would be accepted, even if there is a train with a broken clock that has a single error in there. If we run it with the conditional metrics, the average delay of our train might be expected to be between four and six seconds. Okay, great. But now the value would, of that train would be zero, so the batch is actually rejected. There is an error in the, this batch, so we have to do something with this. And to do this, we developed an approach. Um, we divide this approach up into two phases, a startup phase and a monitoring phase. And let's go through this step by step. So in the startup phase, we have our historical sequence of data. And we want to calculate some data unit tests and then give us some stable data unit tests based on those conditional metrics. 
So let's start with this first part. How do we calculate this data unit test? Well, if you run our conditional metric on a historical sequence, we actually get a single value for that conditional metric on every single batch in our historical data. Then the problem no longer becomes, can we validate this new batch? No, it is, can we check whether or not this new value on the batch of tomorrow, is that an outlier, yes or no? This becomes a bit simpler, so we just have to do that, and for that we can use any univariate outlier detection methods. In my thesis we tested with very simple methods, just the interquartile range, for example the box plots, or, or the average k nearest neighbors. For relatively simple techniques and they seem to work quite well for this, this use case. However, considering all of these conditional metrics might be a bit much. In our example data set, we have 39 million possible conditional metrics, so that's quite a lot. Uh, so we decided to reduce this number a little bit by only keeping those conditional metrics that have less than 5% errors on the historical sequence of data and occur in at least 10% of the batches. For example, with this last part, uh, at least 10% of the batches. Uh, we might have some trains, for example, that only drive in peak hours or just occasional trains that drive very rarely or special transport trains and so on. Uh, and with this less than 5% errors, well, we need some sort of stability. Um, the, the train has to have some expected behavior or the, the entity should have some expected behavior. And that's why we call it a stable conditional metric. It shows a stable behavior in the historical sequence. Um, next up, we only consider conditional metrics of entities. Uh, like I already said, we have this average delay for a specific train. This makes sense to compute, but if we do this the other way around, calculate the average train number for any random delay value, it makes a little bit less sense because this delay is not really an entity. It's not tangible in, in the real world. So that's why we only use, used uh, the entities. And if we combine these two techniques, well, we can reduce this number from 39 million to about 1.8 million. So a bit more manageable, still a lot, but, but drastically reduced. All right, so at this, this part, we have our stable uh, data unit tests. Great, now we can move on to the monitoring phase. And in this monitoring phase, we want to validate those conditional metrics on our new batch, so the batch of tomorrow. Um, and this will give us a set of flagged conditional metrics, those that reported an error, and then using some magical algorithms that I'll go into more detail about, we want to find the tuples with errors. Okay. So the first part, validating the conditional metrics. How do we do this? Well, it's, I've already gone over this a little bit, but let's explain it again. If we run our conditional metric on this data set, just on the top part, we see that the average delay for the train is five in this case. Um, we then run it against our conditional metric, the data unit test that we generated earlier. It's within the expected range of four and six, so this badge is accepted. Now, let's say that this batch did have the broken clock um, for that specific train. Then the average delay would be zero and it would obviously fall outside of the bounds that we expected. So in this case, this conditional metric will become a flagged conditional metric. It reported an error, so it says, hey, there's something wrong here, please check it. Okay, so now we have our flagged conditional metric. Obviously, we don't do this for just a single conditional metric. We do it for all of the conditional metrics that were stable and that might give us a large set of flagged conditional metrics. Now, using some algorithms, we want to find the tuples with errors. And what do I mean by that? Well, which kind of tuples do we want to return? Which tuples do we want to show to a domain expert um, that best describes the root cause of our problem in the data? In this case, it's very simple. If that train has a broken clock, we want to return exactly those tuples of the train. Okay, now how do we do this? Well, what we might see in the real world is that because of this single train that has an error, we also see that many more conditional metrics also report an error. And these can be of different types of entities as well. So just the train has many conditional metrics that reported an error, but we also see that the, uh, the railway track that it took, this also reports an error, and the route itself also reports an error. So there are many more yeah, things interfering with this entity that we, than we like. And that's why we decided to look at the selections of these entities. So we look at all of the entities together or individually and then look at the tuples that these entities select. For the train, it's these three tuples. For the track, it's these three tuples in our data. And the same for the route. So a different selections that we can take based on those, ent on those entities. Then the problem becomes, what selection do we want to return? Well, let's say we just use the intersection of all of our uh, selections here. Then we just return this single tuple at the bottom. 
okay, that's one out of the three tuples that we want. It's good, but we'd like to do better because we're still missing two. So if we want to do more instead of the intersection, let's take the union of all, all of those tuples. And then we just return everything. Um, that might not all help a domain expert all that much because there's still lots of data to go through to manually find the, the error. So we need to do better. And that is why in this algorithm part, we decided to split this up into finding the root cause, uh, we, we labeled it. And we do this in three different parts. First, we create a graph, <laughs> then we can run algorithms on this graph, and finally we use some ranking and gap methodology to find the exact tuples. So let's break this down step by step. First, with the entity tuple graph, what we really want to do is analyze the correlation structure within those selections of the entities. What is this correlation structure? Well, if we look at the selections of our entities again, we want to find how do they correlate to each other. These two selections are linked by the single tuple that they have in common. And then the, the two selections over here, they're linked by these three, three tuples that they have in common. And we can do this by generating a graph. So how do we generate this graph? This is a different visualization of the same data set, let's say. So we have these conditional metrics that reported an error. And we look at, OK, the first one, that's of a train. Which rows does this train select? OK, that's these three rows. And then what we do is, OK, that's tuple 1, tuple 2, and tuple 3. We put the tuples on one side of the graph, and then the entity that selects them on the other side, and draw an edge between them if they are selected. So we know tuple 1 is selected by the train um, because there is an edge between these two nodes. And of course, we do this for all of our entities and tuples that they select. And then we get this very nice graph. And now we can run things on this graph. We can analyze this graph to do uh, stuff with. So for example, we can calculate the tuples of a specific entity. Let's say our entity is this first train here. We can look at these three tuples and say, okay, they are selected by the train because we have three outgoing edges on that train uh, node. So the tuples of that entity are these three. <laughs> we can also do this the other way around, say, okay, which entities are connected to this specific tuple, our tuple T1. And then we look, okay, these two trains, because tuple T1 has two outgoing edges to those trains. And we find the entities. All right, so now that we have our entity tuple graph, and the, what we next want to do is run topology algorithms to generate a score for each entity node within this graph, whereby the goal is that the entities that are most likely the root cause of our problem, they will, be, will have the highest score um, and then we can use this further on. So entities with a, the root cause, they will be ranked the highest. And we do this by running topology algorithms. Well, we might be familiar with page rank, between the centrality, the hits, the average tuple degree, and so on and so forth. We tested many of them, but in the end we came up with our own methodology, uh, which actually seems to work best in, in most use cases. And this is the correlation density. This measure looks at the correlation structure of all of the unique entity sets, because if there are many more entities interfering with uh, the tuples of our specific entities, that means that it's likely the root cause of our problem. Um, so let me explain this a little bit more in detail. We have our single train here, and if we run this formula uh, in there, we see that for this train, there are, let's say, three tuples connected to that train but two unique entity sets. And this gives us a very high correlation density score compared to the other entities. So it's likely the root cause of the problem, which in this case, we know that it is. So that's that. Now that we have the scores, we actually need to determine which tuples we want to return because we didn't want to return all of the entities. That would be the same as the union I described earlier. So how do we do this? Well, it's actually very simple. We determine the ranking of all of those, those entities, which I already did here, just sort them from biggest to smallest. And then we find the biggest consecutive gap between two entities. That's denoted by the blue line here. And then we return all of the tuples from the entities above this, uh, this gap. And in this case, that perfectly describes the error because we found the train with a broken clock. We didn't add any extra rows. So we have a very high precision and we found all of the rows with uh, the, the problem. So we have very high recall as well. So we found the tuples with errors. So again, quick summary. We have the two phases in our approach. The startup phase where we calculate the stable unit tests 
and then in the monitoring phase we validate all of the conditional metrics and find the root cause by generating the entity topple graph, running our correlation density measure on it, and then finally we have the ranking and gap method. So what we did is, of course, we had to experiment with this. Uh, and we, we generated, manually generated some scenarios, realistic scenarios on the, the railway data set from, from the NMBS um, according to some realistic scenarios. For example, the N1 scenario is the one with the broken clock, the N2 scenario uh, is the one with the broken GPS data, and so on and so forth. And we see that results are actually very good, uh, except in this last one, but yeah, we, we found out why that is. The results seem worse than they are. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail due to time constraints, I think. Um, but yeah, we also did the same for another data set, the, a retail data set that's based on um, yeah, websites, web shop data. Um, also, again, modified them and looked at the tuples that you modified and the results are actually pretty decent, uh, let's say. Now, how did the, the supercomputer, because all of our experiments were run on the, the VSC, how did this actually help us? And well, if you look at the VSC for experiments, the first question we want to do is parallelization. How can we parallelize all of our uh, different experiments in this case, or within a single experiment? Um, we can look at our two phases to start. So in the startup phase, we have these 39 million conditional metrics that we need to check, because we have to determine whether they are stable or not. And the great thing is, all of these conditional metrics are completely independent of one another. The average delay for this train has nothing to do with the average delay of that train, and the count has nothing to do with this average delay, and, and so on and so forth. So we can calculate all of them completely in parallel. We don't have to worry about this. Um, so that's obviously one side of the parallelization, and if you have many cores, that helps a lot um, to, to do this. And then the next part is we have about 200 experiments whereby we need to run these 1.8 million stable conditional metrics, so the output from this part. Um, and we have to validate them. Well, again, these 1.8 million uh, stable conditional metrics, they don't really have anything in common, so we can validate them all in parallel again, and at the end of this step, we get a lot of flagged conditional metrics. The last part here, finding the root cause, once we have our flagged conditional metrics, that runs in two or three seconds, so it's not really worth parallelizing this if you have to like, calculate this for 10 minutes. Those two seconds don't really make it worth to, to find the extra code. Now the big question is here, with these 200 experiments, we didn't parallelize this yet. And this really is where the strength of the VSC came in for us, because if we do these 200 experiments on this little laptop here, it would take about one hour per experiment to run. And if we want to iterate over this, well, it, to run all of these 200 experiments, it would take us about eight days to do this without having to yeah, my laptop available for any additional coding or research. So that's not really feasible, especially not if the deadline of the paper is within five days. Um, that, that makes it a bit difficult. Um, so what we did is, well, these 200 experiments, what if we just generate, for example, 200 jobs out of these experiments on the, the supercomputer? And then the supercomputer will actually run many of these jobs in parallel as well. So we have the parallelization within the experiment, but also all of our experiments run on different nodes in, in parallel, which is much better to do this than borrowing computers from colleagues and trying to divide the experiments manually. It, it's a, a big hassle. Yeah, don't do it. Um, but the great thing here is, in all of our experiments, which we had to run many times with different sets of parameters and, and, and yeah, different initialization, let's say, it takes about 10 hours to do all of these 200 jobs. So just one night. You can code for the entire day, submit all of the jobs, and at the end, in the morning when you wake up, the results are already there. You can analyze this again and then iterate for the next day as well. So this really helped us out, especially in the later uh, phases of uh, paper submission deadlines, because, yeah, and it became quite difficult, let's say. Uh, many sleepless nights as well. All right, so that's really where the, the VSC uh, came in to help us uh, there. So in conclusion, because I think I'm over time already, we developed a technique to identify the root cause of errors uh, for fine-grained errors in our data by using conditional metrics compared to the column-based metrics. And then we came up with our correlation density um, metric to filter out with the entity tuple graph, uh, generate better scores there. And finally, yeah, uh, again, I want to highlight that VSC assisted with the experimental validation for this because yeah, it, it helped us out uh, a lot, and I think my laptop is also very happy that the, the VSC did everything there. 
Okay, so that was my brief presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.